we're in a workspace that's built for your particular way of working. Right. And um, so this this is a studio that you've been in for what about five years now? Um, more like six, I think. Five mm -hmm. or six, yeah. yeah. Well, we moved here uh, <clears throat> shortly before 2016, so it was about eight months. Okay. Into, anyway, and uh, and one of the reasons we bought this house was this space down here that I could utilize as a studio. Yeah. And I've cut, I've custom uh, it to be to fit my needs. I you know I can come over here. <laughs> this this part here has to do with when I was doing um, wax. Uh, and, uh, and caustics. Yeah. So this was designed for that, and which I don't, I haven't done in a long time, and I don't know if I'll ever do again. It probably will someday. But for some time, I was doing the caustics, and uh, so this is my setup that I built for that, and including the exhaust fan. Yes. Yeah. Especially if you're dealing with some kind of chemicals. But the chemical that I deal with a lot is um, with. Rubbing alcohol with uh -huh. isopropylene, it's called, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, just, it's, just, it's in here, the spray bottles. So that's yeah. what I use for reducing the, or, or making the transparency. <coughs> reducing and yeah, the so alcohol is a solvent. Yeah, a solvent for. Uh, and then, so then you're, you're, yeah. you're applying paint and then you're dissolving it. Right. I have. Uh, um, that you can intercept. I have a bunch of videos showing the technique. But this is like, first layer was gesso with a modeling paste. Second layer was this black cover that you see here. Diluted, of course. Third layer was this cream color. And, uh, and then these are separate layers of color that I sporadically placed. And then um, the last layer was this purple. So then when you apply, you see all this splatter, and when you apply the, the um, alcohol, it dilutes and I can push and pull it, make it thinner or thicker or whatever. After the first design decision is made, which is the uh, texture in the background, Mm -hmm. you know, that that is you know the complete blank canvas. So now I'm so I'm worried about that design and how all that works together as I go. And uh, it's not really like you know thinking about it a lot. It's just it comes out. Yeah. And then I sand that down uh, with my electric sander to make it nice and flat, and you still have the texture. So I'm more interested in the visual texture than I am in the tactile texture. But in this case, it really is both. Yeah. Anyway. And um, one of the things that you showed me when I first saw you down in this studio several years ago was you had built this easel. Yes. So when I'm working like this, I get I do some drips or whatever, certain techniques, and then the, the idea is that if the drip starts, you know, and I don't want it to go all the way down, it can stop it. Ah. Way, you know? So the drip is like you see in this painting right here, you see it? You see it? these little dots? Yeah. Then we just drop some color, and then I lifted the the easel, and I put it right, when it got to a certain length, length, I put it back down again. So you can see they're almost all kind of the same length, depending on how much pigment there is in them. All of your past history, personal history, yeah. somehow appears in lots of these, in one way or another. I think another. these newer pieces for me, or more recent pieces, start bringing back my inherit my heritage or my my ethnic background the colors the shapes 
the forms, you know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Latin influence in there too. Um, and uh, uh, um, that accumulation of all these experiences of living in Puerto Rico, in the background of all, with all these artists, especially my father, and then making the decision that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. That's what influenced all that. And then, you know, I went to Wayne State University and the printmaking, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, like I explained before, all these techniques kind of show up here too. So it's, uh, at that one point, I got to where my sort of spiritual, again, that ugly word, which is not really ugly, but made it to be very ugly, you know what I mean? Uh, my soul part, or whatever you want to call it, came in two and across with with my work, the artwork. And I, you know, I saw that piece there. Friend, I told you this is transitional piece. Mm. That's when I it really, really hit me. Um, and then the accumulation of all that, and the turning point is what you see in this new work. Which you're calling the vision series. Yeah, and, and again, uh, you, when I first started and I, and I started to uh, uh, think about the work and I was, at the time, reading the, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is the American name for it, uh, and explaining all this stuff about the between and the bardos and all that. Uh, 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 I started thinking of it as visions of the bardo. But then, as more I'm doing this, it's not really just about that. It's just visions. So we can eliminate the part that might talk about Buddhism and all that, but in reality, and actually, all, all paintings, in one way or another, are visions of the artist. Right? Yeah. So I, I call it the vision series. Instead of, you know, a lot of people call their work like this uh, untitled. Yeah. Untitled one, untitled two, because again, they want people to bring their own experience with that. But I like the, the idea of visions and number them, you know, vision, because that way the only reference to anything outside is, you know, instead of calling them horses or fish in the sea or something like that, visions is that the viewer, oh, okay, those, these are the visions of this artist, his, his visions of whatever he's thinking at the time he's creating. Simply put then, vision is in the sense of, this is what I see. This is what I see and feel. Because the vision has two, two parts to it. The vision has, you know, the, what you see, and then of course the vision when you close your eyes. So it's a combination of, again, the manifested and the unmanifested. Let's talk a little bit about your progress um, over the past several years toward abstraction. Actually, I had a discussion with my good friend, uh, Kevin Campbell, and uh, we, we were talking about the iconography and then the pure abstraction. Uh, you know, and I talked about uh, people like Kandinsky and uh, um, Mark Toby and all these artists that were starting to see the, or starting to do their work in pure abstraction because it was more what they called spiritual. It was more soul. It was more um, uh, uh, more about the feeling of the work rather than the imagery in the work. Okay, what the colors do psychologically speaking, or what their shapes do. Yeah. Even though they were abstract shapes. Yeah. Uh, and how the viewer and the mind and. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that at that time is when all of the, the uh, uh, major breakthroughs in psychology were, were happening too. Uh, you know, uh, Freud and Jung and all these people uh, were talking more about subconscious 
And they, in those days, of course, it's surrealism and people working in it, surrealism, which again was all full of iconography, surrealism. And then you they say, well, wait a minute, let's 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 separate what the ideas are from what the emotion or what the what what the the viewer brings to instead of the artist telling him look at a horse or look at this or the, the viewer now sees their own uh, interpretation of the paintings and you know everybody has a different interpretation which is the meaning that the piece is not just about the piece itself but about the, about the viewer and that was one of the things that abstract expressionism or even before that uh, brought to art where art was more about um, not the content in terms of imagery, but in terms of, of, of you know, that, that, uh, that psychological. We're sitting in your studio, mm -hmm. and we are looking at a couple of paintings that are part of the Vision series here. Uh, the one that is right behind you there is one that you've just completed mm -hmm. and uh, is in the exhibition that's now at Gordy. Let's just talk a little bit about your state of mind as your because I feel like these paintings and we're going to talk about this a little bit more too but these paintings are there they exist in time because your your progress of making them mm -hmm. is this process of cause and effect and so if it's a if it's an improvisation in the jazz sense mm -hmm. then it also exists in time your process of making it yes so what's the state of mind? Um, that's a very good question. And I think a lot of artists have a different, obviously different uh, um, ideas and concepts of what, 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 makes, what makes the artist make art, basically, is what it is. Um, uh, the, Work is really a necessity, a need, you know? Uh, like any other artist, you know, you need to do this work because it's something inside of you that needs to come out visually or musically or poetry or whatever the, whatever the medium may be. So that kind of is the same for, I, I would imagine, for most artists. Um, and for me, what it is, is when I start laying, first of all, you start with, with the, the, the first thing you do, you start with the format. You pick a format, whatever, vertical, horizontal, right? As soon as that's done, that, that right there contains, uh, a, a, what do you call a, a, a limit, a visual limit, okay? So then you start applying and as I'm applying, in this case, and the work, the work that I'm doing now, and I've been doing for a while, is is you apply the textures, and there's already design consciousness, when, or or art consciousness, or whatever you want to call it, with the execution of the texture in the background, because that's all it's a building block. So I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is really not thinking at all. It's sort of emotional, it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, improvisational. So when I lay shapes down at the texture level, then it's, it's already this flow that's coming through, you know, through whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, the experience, the, the consciousness, uh, you know, all the, the terminology. And, and like they say, it, actually there is no Word that can words that can really describe that. It's like trying to describe meditation. There, there is no real words you can, you know. It's it, it's beyond language. It's the visual language. Okay. So when I'm doing that, there it comes all of the cause and effect that we've been talking about. So the texture, what happens with it at the at the level of the texture, or the texture level, um, that causes that that's the cause and then the effect comes 
after now analyzing that or 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 feeling whatever I, I've laid down and then the next level starts okay which is color uh, and like you saw in some of the, in the preliminary videos all this color comes uh, sort of like an explosion sometimes uh, and uh, after it's all laid down then I start looking at areas that suggest shapes or suggest compositions. So then I start blocking those areas. Uh, once, once I lay a block down, when, you know, I used to, I, I, I do it two different ways. Sometimes I do it where I just lay a shape down and I stand back and look at that shape. And what, the, what is that shape? I mean, I mean, cut out in paper a shape. What does that shape mean to the rest of the composition? And then I'll lay another piece of paper down and study it. And then I'll lay another piece of paper down. So it's a process of cause and effect. Study, action, reaction. Action, reaction. Action, reaction. The whole process. Uh, and then when that's done and the paper's removed and there's left colors and textures, then those start to speak as a composition or as a, you know, as whatever they are at that stage. And I start making decisions based on what it's, what it's saying to me. It's talking to me. So it's a constant conversation between the piece and the artist. I, I'm hearing that as a literal conversation. Oh, yeah. Well, um, yeah. I mean, yes, yeah. yeah, but we, I want to talk about that part too. But, yeah. but that, that, the conversation that you're having with your painting. Yes communicates to me this idea that of interdependence that you yes. talk about sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I'm hearing you talk about your process or your state of mind, yes. I'm thinking that you are, you, you call it flow. I mean, it can be called like... In the moment, in the groove. All those words that really don't, really can't explain it. They can't explain. No, but but you can get an idea what what yeah. You're yeah. kind of one with oh, yeah. the thing you're there's doing. There's battles sometimes. There's a battle. This painting and the one before this, you know, there was. I was telling my sister, man, it's kicking my ass. The painting is kicking my ass. It really is because I'm looking at it. It's it's not resolved. There's there's trauma in this painting. There's something not right, you know, and that comes again from uh, the combination of the, the manifested side, manifested meaning the material side, and the unmanifested side, you know, whatever you want to call that, spiritual or blah, blah, or intellectual, you know, uh, and that cause and effect too. You might call it what's done and what's not done. Right. Also. What, yeah, right, yeah. So what's, what, what's laid down yes, and then what the potential of it. Right. That's it, still... Yes. Somewhere. Yes. And you're the person that's putting it down. Yes. And I, and then, you know, and I'm analyzing, uh, uh, maybe sometimes I'll overanalyze. It's like writing a composition in music, too. You overanalyze it and you write something that uh, is too, too, too forte or too fuerte or whatever. And then you erase that. No, I don't erase, but, you know, I, I, I start pushing and pulling. Okay, that needs to reside. This needs to come out because it, it's not making, to me, it's not making sense. It's not coming across, uh, um, uh, which is incredible. Okay, and uh, this is what I love about this type of work is that, you know, it's, you, you know, when you paint a horse jumping over a fence, it, if it's accurate, if it's good, and the lighting is right, and all that, and you can correct that as you go. This is not, you know, at all. This is, you know, completely abstract, completely, you're completely immersed in, you know, intellectually, uh, scientifically, if you want to call it that, um, and, you know, spiritually, uh, which is the most important part, because that's the part that talks to everybody else. Everybody has that spirit. Everybody has their own way of thinking about what is real, what is not real. Everybody looks at this and it's their own reality. This is my reality for now. My reality 
changes actually and, and what is reality. That's a whole other philosophical argument that could last hours and hours and hours. Yeah. But but that's what's going on through the process. That that you know you hear, hear artists agonize. Well, I'm not agonizing. You know, I'm not going to cut my ear off or anything like that. <laughs> but there is, you know, my father used to say that there's there is pain in painting. You know, there is this, you know, this, you know, this, this, you, the painting is looking at you and staring at you and saying, this is where I am right now. Where are you? Okay. You know, finish me or, <laughs> or do something. Uh, and a lot of times the best thing to do is just see you tomorrow. <laughs> and then the next day I come in the morning and I'll look at it and go, oh, I see. Or... You know, and it's funny because it's a process that never stops because I think about it all day long. And when I'm going to sleep, you know, in the morning I'll wake up, oh yeah, I can change this, I can do this. And, you know, it's this conversation that I have with myself and with the peace, with the art. Which is, when you're done, then you go, ah, it's, yes, it's, you know. And then you go, now what? <laughs> <laughs> my goal is to express myself. That's it. It's simple. Also, this would be non, really non-Buddhist, the little non-Buddhist, or a lot of non-Buddhist that is in every person or myself, is I, not that I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave something for posterity. Be it for my children, grandchildren, whatever it is. That's, you know. It's sort of leave your little, your little mark on the world, which is really, if you think, nothing. Because, <laughs> you know, 3,000 3, years from now, 4,000 years, a million years from now, the planet might not even exist. So right. it's for the moment, living the moment. And I think, I think that's what all this is about too, living in that moment. Living in the moment that you're confronted with it, living in the moment of creation, living in the moment of reflection, but in the moment.